Hey, I'm Jesse, let's have a devotion. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter five, and these verses are dense, man. I find myself just doing an entire devotion on just, just one single verse, and then even feeling like I left stuff on the table, it's, it's hard. Here's, uh, here's 2 Corinthians chapter five, beginning in verse 14. For the love of Christ compels us. Since we have reached this conclusion, if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. This is what Jesus said it meant to follow him, to every single day, take up your cross, take up your instrument of capital punishment, take up your means of execution, and follow him. That's what it means to follow Christ. It's, I've heard pitches of the gospel that are very popular, very prominent, and evidently this approach to the gospel like really packs out arenas. I mean, there are, there are pastors whose approach to the gospel is strictly this, like if you give your life to Jesus, then you're just gonna receive blessings upon blessings upon blessings upon blessings, and it's gonna be great, and you're gonna prosper, and your breakthrough is just around the corner, and all you gotta do is give your life to Christ and stick with it, and then he's gonna cause your, he's gonna cause your bank account to overflow. And if you just give to this ministry, then all of your problems will go away. That, that's, a, that's a really like short version of an entire framework, an entire like false hermeneutic to apply scripture. Uh, and it's, it's very brief, but it's, it's effective in boosting numbers. It's a great way to really boost your numbers if you just focus on the blessings that come from following Christ. The problem is that these people leave disillusioned because then, you know, they've got to face trial and difficulty and loss and tragedy, and they're ill-equipped biblically to do so unless they've been reading the scripture on, on their own. They're utterly aghast when they face trial and difficulty and pain. This was also a misuse of uh, Pascal's wager. Pascal's wager sort of evaluates the risk that the Christian takes in giving his or her life to Christ versus the risk that the atheist takes and finding that the atheist takes far greater a risk when it comes to betting all of eternity here and then the payoff for the Christian according to some iterations of Pascal's Wager. Again, Pascal's Wager is not a proof of God. It's just something that sort of frames the discussion. But Blaise Pascal, this French philosopher, put it this way, that the Christian, the Christian takes less of a risk, whereas the, the atheist is betting it all on there not being a God modern versions of Pascal's Wager would go on to say, but then the Christian also gets fellowship with other believers, and there's all sorts of advantages to that. Uh, you get, you're not living life alone. You have your small group, and you have your friends. Your rider dies through thick or thin, and there's some, there are benefits to getting together in groups of people, and singing songs it creates unity, and it gives you endorphin rushes, and, and then you also have the other sort of advantages in the business world, in the political world, because you have these connections through church, and, and it's just good to have friends. It's good to be in the church. It's good to experience the Holy Spirit of God. Of course, that's good, but it emphasizes all the goodness that comes from following Jesus. And the, 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 the way that our atheist friends applied that was say, hey, cool, then we'll start our own churches. And for a while there, I don't know if they're still around as much, but there were these atheist mega churches that would get together and sing Beatles songs. <laughs> and they were like, oh, if that's all there is to Christianity, then let's take that, let's do that. The truth of Christianity is that it will cost you everything. That to follow Christ is to take up your cross daily. Paul in Romans 6 would go on to say, it's like, look, you died to self. It's like we had a funeral for that old version of you. To follow Christ isn't just to receive blessings and be a part of a nice country club. To follow Christ is to die daily. Every day you have the opportunity to do something just for yourself and live for yourself and glorify yourself, or you can glorify God. And if you glorify yourself, you're not glorifying God. Every day we have this opportunity. The love of Christ compels us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. Because Christ died for all of us, we likewise are to die in our selfish lives. We take that selfish version of ourselves and we bury him. We bury her every single day. And we choose instead to live for Christ. We're not living for our own selves, but we're living for Christ. What compels us to do this? Is it some sort of manipulative tactic 
on God? Is it a guilt trip from God? No, what does the text say? It's, a, it's the love of Christ. He loves us with the greatest love there is. Greater love has no man than this than he laid on his life for his friends. It is exactly that that Christ did for us, and so now we reciprocate. We lay down our lives to follow Christ. The love of Christ compels us since we have reached this conclusion. If one died for all, then all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I'm no longer living for myself. I, if I, Jesse Campbell, were to live for myself, I'd st probably, still be on, probably still be doing the electrical engineering thing. And I would just really want to collect cool sports cars. And it would all just be about money. That would be it. And I'd want to be on vacation as much as possible. Like that would really be, that would really be me living for myself. That's, that's the version of me that's all about myself. But that, that version of me is dead and gone. I strive not to live for myself anymore, but to live for God. What is that, what is that old version of you? If there's not much distinction between the version of you that lives for yourself and the version of you that lives for Christ, then let the Holy Spirit bring conviction where he brings it. We don't live for ourselves, but we live for the one who died for us and was raised. All right, happy burial day. Put to death the old self. You're compelled by the love of Christ to live not for yourself, but for God. Paul is explaining why his lifestyle is what his lifestyle is. He'd come under scrutiny by the super apostles, and he chose to live this destitute lifestyle marked by pain and suffering, which he'll catalog when we get to chapter 11 in brutal detail. But he's doing this because he doesn't live for himself. His life is worth more than just Paul. Your, your life is worth more than just you. There's far more to your life than having a well-padded 401k. There's more to your life than having a, a great real estate portfolio. There's more to your life than having a luxurious vacation once a month. That, that's, that may be success by worldly standards, but if we give an account before God at the end of our days and all we have to show is a Roth IRA that was well tended, we failed. That's a failure of a life. Rather, we don't live for ourselves. The demarcations of success in the Christian life are actually self-sacrifice. What we have sacrificed and that we live instead for God. This is the demarcations of success in the Christian life. God's hand upon our lives, the fruit that we bear for his kingdom. It's not for our own glory, it's for him. We are dead. He is alive. Every single day we take up our cross and we follow Jesus. That means we put to death the selfish ambition and instead we take up the cross of Christ every single day.